Good afternoon, uh, everyone in Philippines and Asia Pacific, uh, and good morning to our colleagues uh, joining us from Europe. My name is Jan. Uh, I'm very pleased to be uh, hosting today's uh, webinar. It is another uh, of our series of live events under the Cold Chain Innovation Hub, uh, part of the uh, improving of the, of the food cold chain uh, project in Philippines. I'm here uh, with my colleague Devin, who is the communication lead of the Culture and Innovation Hub. And we are very happy to be together moderating our event dedicated to solar cooling for food culture. We believe this is a very uh, exciting topic to be uh, presented to the local industry and the experts around the world, because it helps address many of the uh, challenges that we have identified uh, over the past uh, months working on the uh, improving of the food coaching in, uh, in Philippines project. So we're very happy to have uh, two expert guests today who will be talking about their experience with the concept of solar cooling in uh, their uh, field of expertise, both on the micro as well as the macro level uh, of, the, of the technology and the implementation in the market. We have uh, a very short uh, agenda to introduce to you today. We will start with a short introduction. We have then uh, our first guest, Mr. Ivan Katic from Danish Technology Institute, who will be introducing the solar direct drive refrigeration, including uh, the results of their field test of the technology that was implemented uh, already in the field. And we have our second uh, speaker, Mr. Larry Acera, from Sunray Power, who will be talking about using, uh, of course, uh, the solar power for the largest scale projects, including a very exciting uh, project that they are working on currently on the ground in Philippines. With that, uh, we would just like to uh, give a little bit of the background to the discussion that we will be presented today. And I will ask uh, my colleague Devin uh, to uh, maybe summarize a little bit why this topic is so relevant to the uh, to the to the industry in Philippines and Southeast Asia. Devin, please. Yes, thank you, Jan. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who is joining us uh, from all around the world today. We have a a, a lot of participants, and uh, everybody is, um, I think, really looking forward to our presentation today. I mean, our presentations today, we uh, chose solar cooling as a theme for our webinar uh, this time around for the Cold Chain Innovation Hub in our webinar series. Uh, this is solar cooling for the food cold chain, uh, specifically as applied to the, uh, the Philippines. And uh, just a little bit of uh, reasoning why we chose this, this topic uh, as one of uh, our webinars is... Um, with our research and everything that we've been doing uh, over the past few months and with the help of our Cold Chain Innovation Hub community, we've uh, found that and we've identified that this is one of the um, biggest uh, areas of need for uh, cooling and, in fact, clean cooling technology. And one of the um, terms that was used by um, several speakers uh, during our Atmosphere Asia uh, conference that we were partnered with uh, Sheko on executing just uh, very recently, um, that this post-harvest uh, sector is really uh, in need um, of cooling technologies, and not only cooling technologies that can be applied today, um, but cooling technologies that can be applied with a, a, a thought towards sustainable um, operation economically, environmentally, um, and as well as well as uh, energy efficiently going on into the years in the future where we know that this infrastructure is really important for the Philippines. So that's why we're really excited today to introduce to you our two speakers, uh, Mr. Ivan Kacic from the Danish Technological Institute, who will be giving a presentation on the solar direct drive uh, refrigeration type of technology that they've been implementing uh, for many years now in several countries around the world as well as uh, Mr. Larry Acera from Sunray Power Incorporated, uh, based in the Philippines, and they are the, uh, they are the developers of a new uh, 100 megawatt solar utility scale solar uh, installation that is also attached to uh, microgrids, uh, solar microgrids that are uh, dispersed around through a project called New Clark City in the Philippines, which is a very exciting project dealing with uh, sustainability and uh, a new green city in the Philippines. So 
We're uh, really excited to introduce them to you today. And uh, if I may ask uh, Ivan, uh, let's see if we can get him to join us uh, now. Uh, please give us a few seconds. Uh, Devin, in the in the meantime, if you can hear me, I will just shortly uh, introduce the console oh, okay. that all the delegates yeah. can see uh, on their screens. Uh, there is uh, partners of the project. You can click on the logos. It will take you to the website. You can learn more about the project, about ways that you can get uh, involved in the project. You can sign up to our regular newsletter, not to miss any update. And of course, uh, you can find the resources uh, on the right side of the bottom of the screen, as well as the profiles of our speakers. So don't hesitate to get in touch with our speakers. And also, don't hesitate to submit your questions or comments. We will have about 15 minutes to address the questions after the uh, presenters. So please let us know what you think. Uh, we have heard a lot from several uh, of the stakeholders on the ground uh, that has expressed their interest and they would actually like to see some of these technologies being deployed in the ground. So let us know what you think. And uh, with that, oh, maybe final note, uh, again, we have already more than 100 of participants signed up from several countries, not only in Asia Pacific, but elsewhere in the world. So we're very happy to provide this platform for uh, the discussion. With that, uh, as Devin already mentioned, we welcome uh, Ivan uh, Katic from DTI to be our first speaker. And uh, Ivan, the, the virtual stage is yours, so please uh, go on. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Devin and, and Jan. I'm excited to be in this uh, webinar. And uh, as, as you said, I'm from the Danish Technological Institute uh, located near Copenhagen. Uh, we are dealing with uh, research and development activities for uh, solar energy and a lot of other the technologies, but I will focus on uh, on this specific uh, item today. I'm a mechanical engineer by background and worked uh, more than 20 years uh, with solar energy uh, projects. And uh, in this uh, webinar, I'll, I'll give you a short introduction to the solar energy technology, uh, broadly speaking, and then I will focus on the on the solar direct drive technology specifically. And I'll tell a little bit about our our projects uh, on the way. So let me switch to the next slide. Um, yes, the title is just on this one. And um, on this um, overview, uh, I'll give you a little bit of the background on the solar chill activities uh, at the DTI. It started back in year 2000, where there was a meeting in the Montreal protocol on uh, on greenhouse gases from the refrigeration sector. And at that, that meeting, there was established a, a group called uh, the Solar Chill Consortium. And the idea with this consortium was that we would like to develop uh, a clean uh, solar driven technology without uh, the usual lead acid batteries and without any harmful substances in the production or in the refrigeration circuit. So it's quite a, a time ago. And from that time on, it, it went on with different projects. The first solar chill project in 2002 with proof of, of uh, concept. And then uh, various uh, demonstration projects uh, in, in third world countries where the, the, pro the products were field tested. And we got a lot of interesting experience. The latest uh, projects uh, started in uh, 2018, with the further development of the solar direct drive technology with the Danish company Westfrost and the compressor manufacturer Seacop. And I'll come back to that later. If you'd like to know more about the Solar Chill project, you can see it on the website uh, solarchill.org. And uh, on the right hand, you see the logos of all the involved, involved partners in this uh, Solar Chill consortium. So be very welcome to visit the, that website. If we uh, take a broader look on uh, the solar resources and uh, and perspectives, I have reproduced a, a map, a world solar map. And uh, what is important to mention is that if you look at usual solar maps, it's mostly representing the average 
or the annual solar insulation. But when we talk about solar standalone systems without connection to the grid and without any further supplement of energy, it's, ex it's very important that we look at the months with the minimum solar irradiance. So as you see on the left uh, corner, this is an extreme example from the UK where there's hardly any sun in the, in the winter months. So if you want to design a, a system that can run all year round, we have to, uh, to take uh, uh, we have to take that into consideration that we have a very uneven distribution between summer and winter. And because we also have a daily irradiation profile, but that's, that one is very easy to smoothen out by use of, um, of adequate storage technologies. And it's very fortunate that for solar cooling, we have an almost perfect match between the cooling load and the resource, as opposed to solar heating systems. Uh, to give you a, an impression of the power of the sun, intensity is, is up to one kilowatt per square meter. So if we could just use a fraction of that, we, we have a, a huge resource. And uh, IEA has actually actually mentioned uh, or appointed solar energy as, as king of the renewable energies. And I would say that's true because it's the background for all the other renewable sources that we have, uh, wind and hydro and so forth. So let's see at the, at the refrigeration technologies. Uh, we have three principles. We have the solar absorption cooling, known as um, known from uh, gas or kerosene-driven refrigerators that work without electricity. You can make similar versions working on solar energy, but you need very high temperatures, and uh, they need a lot of uh, of cooling, passive cooling. Uh, with large heat exchangers, so they are hardly found in the market anymore. They are quite expensive to construct. Next one is solar PV with battery storage and maybe an inverter if you want to run an AC appliance. These systems are in the market in, in many countries and work quite well. But the drawback is that we rely on a battery and these batteries, they tend to break down uh, or maybe to get stolen or hard to replace if you are out in the jungle or in the mountains somewhere very remote. So therefore, we like to develop the solar direct drive, so-called SDD technology, where the solar panels are just connected to a DC compressor, as you see on the, on the bottom picture. So how does it work? Um, in principle, it's very simple. As I said, you just connect the DC solar panels to a DC compressor and then it will run. It's not that simple though, because uh, a compressor needs a certain inrush current. So therefore, if you do nothing else, you need to oversize the PV panels to a very, very high uh, safety factor of uh, four to five. So this is not an economical way to do it. The storage is uh, usually ice in these um, constructions because ice has a very high latent heat capacity. So the, so the energy density is comparable to a lead acid battery. We are completely independent on the grid, which is a, a huge uh, advantage. And uh, nowadays it's a proven technology. There are many providers of this technology if we talk small scale refrigerators. And they are, they are approved by the so-called WHO PQS systems. This is the World Health Organization they have promoted this technology in the vaccine cold chain sector. But it would be very interesting if we could upscale it to, to food technology. So that's uh, what I'm going to talk more about. The drawback is that we need special cabinets designs, uh, including thermal storage. And we need a special compressor that can easily start up on a solar PV panel. And uh, the speciality about solar PV panels is that the current increases with the radiance, but as we had a limited amount of irradiance, the current cannot uh, be uh, unlimited. So typically we have a current about uh, 10 amps for such a PV panel. And the voltage is between 25 and 50 volts. But if you could construct a compressor that can uh, in an intelligent way start up with, without too much inrush, 
current, then uh, then it could work. And this is exactly what CCOP have done, or formerly Danfoss compressors. So on the pictures below, you see the normal start procedure on the left, where the current is actually higher than the power limit from the PV panel. And on the right picture, you see that if we can limit the interest current, then we can actually start it up uh, maybe even early in the morning so we can have a long runtime and freeze down the cold store. So this uh, compressor, um, it's quite old. This is uh, called CCOP BD35K. It was delivered, originally developed for, for trucks and mobile appliances. But since then, it uh, was adapted with a special solar controller so we can have this uh, very smooth start. It's not very energy efficient, uh, which is a drawback, of course, and the cooling capacity is also quite limited to around 100 watt. Um, this refrigerator compressor is used by almost all, all solar direct drive suppliers today. There are a few exceptions, but most of them use this platform. And uh, by doing that, we have uh, a minimum demand of 50 to 60 watt PV panel power, which will normally correspond to um, to a, a cloudy, semi-cloudy day. Then we can start it up. So let's see on the, on the products that are on the market. We have two basic principles. We have one one called the ice pack type, where you can see we have a we have a chest type refrigerator with a, a wrap around uh, heat exchanger around the ice storage. The ice storage is, is uh, in blue. So uh, the refrigerant will cool down the ice storage and at, at some point it will freeze. And then we'll have a, around zero degrees in our storage. And maybe we have a few plus degrees in the, in the compartment in the middle. The problem or the challenge with this type is that if we freeze the, the ice storage to, let's say, minus 15, then we are also risk to have freezing in the compartment. And for, um, for medicals, this is a, a disaster because then uh, it, got, it gets destroyed. So the regulation of the temperature is extremely important for these applications. For the tank type below, uh, this is a patent by the so-called Schuertil company. They have designed a, a unit, an upright unit. So there's a, a door in the, in the side, in the front. And uh, the storage is in the form of a large water tank surrounding the compartment. And you can see that the evaporator is in the top of this water tank. So what happens when we start cooling is that we can build up ice in the top and then uh, water has this uh, strange um, phenomenon that water at four degrees C has the highest density. So when the water is cooled, it will fall down around the storage volume or the compartment. So we will always have around four degrees C around the compart compartment. So this is a very elegant way to, uh, to have passive uh, temperature control. But uh, the drawback is that these tanks are quite big and heavy. So when you transport these units to the field, they are empty, and then you have to, to fill up with water on site. So these are the basic principles, and uh, WHO, they are testing these units for a so-called reference solar day of 3.5 kilowatt hours per square meter per day. So this is the amount of insulation that will hit your solar panels. So this is basic basis for the design and for the sizing of the system. They are tested up to 40, 43 degrees C uh, surrounding temperature. So what is special about this market? It is that uh, we have this very strict demand that the internal temperature should stay between two and eight degrees C because it's uh, what, this, what is uh, demanded by the medical industry. It's a very subsidized market with high focus on reliability and not so much on cost. So they are actually very expensive compared to household appliances. 
they are not too big, so they are not suitable for food storage in large quantities. These are some challenges we have. On the other hand, they are well tested and there are many products in the market and we have a lot of experience by now. Some of these models also have water pack freezing because in the, in the vaccine cold chain, you need to bring the, the cold uh, vaccine to the most remote areas where you can't bring the, the fridge itself, but you need a, a carrying bag with a water pack. And um, now in these COVID-19 uh, days, the interest is, of course, extra high on these appliances because we will need a, a lot of new cooling technology for, for the vaccine sector. The five units you see on this picture, they are the five models that we have tested in the ongoing project. Uh, it's a UNEP uh, project. Uh, these units have the have a size of 20 to 100 uh, liters, typically, and you can see that they have different designs. They have been tested for more than uh, one year in the field now, and uh, on the SolarChill website, you can see some of the preliminary data. Um, this is a graph of the monitoring over one year runtime and it's, uh, it's average values for the five different models you have seen. They are anonymized because we promised that uh, for the, uh, what is it, um, the manufacturers, because they have delivered the, the project, these uh, items. And you can see that there's quite some difference. Um, the blue line, for example, shows that we almost have two to eight degrees, 100% of the time all over the year. And the yellow one, it seems to have a problem in, in some of the month. And these uh, problems have been investigated and mostly they have been due to poor thermostat function, uh, unco uncontrollable internal heat flows if it was a poor design, or that the ice bank has not been fully frozen. And if that happens, we do not have the full thermal capacity. That means if you have some cloudy days, the vaccine will heat up, uh, which is not uh, optimal. Leak of refrigerant is, uh, of course, a very important failure. And uh, we have reported that back to the manufacturers and hopefully they will uh, upgrade their products based on this information. So which new markets uh, could be inside for this technology? Food and drinks are obvious. And in the ongoing solar chip, Solar Chill Jeff project, we have uh, just dispersed uh, about 20 units for test in the field for this um, application. But because the models, they have quite limited size, they have so far only been uh, distributed to small uh, shops in, uh, in the recipient countries. And the products tested are from West Coast, they are from uh, LEF, this is the one you see in the middle in the picture. And here, by, by the way, you can see there is a kind of ice lining around the, the cabinet. Uh, then we have Palfridge in uh, Swaziland and some manufacturers in Colombia. They have been producing prototypes for our project. This is a picture of a typical application. This is in Iswatini or Swaziland, as it's also called. Uh, we have uh, we have installed the units in uh, in off grid uh, small groceries in the countryside and collected information and feedback from the users and uh, the positive feedback is that the sales have increased by 15 by 20 percent only because they can uh, they can serve cool drinks or milk or whatever they sell but it's mainly mainly cold drinks that have been increasing in in sales. The feedback is also that they would like bigger capacity of the fridges and they would like a freezer compartment because, of course, they try to compare this technology with usually plug-in appliances, which is not completely fair, but uh, this is what the users will do if they do not know anything about the, the technology in, in details. 
a positive feedback is is also that in some cases they are saving gas for gas driven refrigerators in these uh, very remote areas. So this can be a very good uh, business case indeed. How can we improve the technology further? We try to uh, investigate that in an ongoing project with Westpost and Seacop. And as you see in this picture, we are testing as a, a physically smaller um, um, fridge, but uh, uh, sorry, compressor, but with very uh, much better performance, a better dynamic range, uh, higher capacity. So with this one, we can almost double the cooling capacity. So that will give an opportunity to to test larger appliances in the future. One could also t think about upscaling by using several small compressors in cascade configuration, or you could use ordinary AC appliances with an inverter and just use a small battery for a startup and, and then have a large uh, storage tank, for example, with ice lorry as a thermal storage, which is much cheaper than electrical storage. And you could also think about cold store in uh, passive mass storage in the buildings itself if, if they are constructed on site. And generally speaking, it's much easier to make a, a bigger system because you have a, a higher a volume per surface area, and therefore the heat control is much easier. And if you should look for commercial uh, applications, it's important that you look for products that do not require too much cooling capacity, but have a high sales value if they, if they are sold cool. And of course, uh, medicals are, are one of the very good examples but it could also be other, other uh, special products. But if you're going to sell frozen fish, for example, it will require a lot of freezing capacity and, and higher cost of the systems. And uh, this is not impossible, but it's just uh, worth to mention. So how can we help you to proceed? We have a small technology transfer guide which you can down download on the SolarTeal website. And we can also uh, we can also provide testing of prototypes on the DTI. We have an accredited lab for these measurements. And uh, of course, you can le read more about field experience also on the Solar Chill website. So time is up almost. So summary and outlook. The um, technology has been proven to work. It is robust and mostly reliable, but there's still some improvements to be done. It's a very fast growing technology in the vaccine cold chain. And I think it could also be in the cold chain for food in the future, at least uh, some food items. The new generation of compressor will enable us to use less solar panels, so it's cheaper systems. We can run larger refrigerators, including freezers, and you can even build walk-in cold rooms. So um, these were the last last words and i thank you for listening and hope to see some interesting questions after the presentation thank you ivan thank you very much uh, it was a fantastic presentation lots of interesting uh, ideas uh, maybe we ask you to come back uh, ivan we have just had him uh, off but hopefully he will join us i see ivan excellent evan we have a question for you um, this technology basically over the last 15 20 years there was a lot of work done in terms of developing the technology as well as testing it on the ground. So you have you have already a number of uh, data points. You have also identified the challenges. Now for the Philippines, a country with 7,000 islands and a lot of, uh, let's say, need for off-grid solutions based on, renewable, uh, or based on renewable energies. I see two ways, two pathways. Can you please comment on which one is possible more likely? One pathway is to actually have this technology bring to Philippines, brought to Philippines, tested and implemented. And the second part, is it possible that you would then be able to support the local manufacturers to actually have the industry to develop their own solutions based on your guide and your, your expertise? Which of these two you see a possibility for Philippines? Uh, I would say it depends on the existing uh, cooling industry in the Philippines, which I do not know in detail. But if you have an industry that's used to, to build 
uh, their own uh, appliances and, and can redesign them, then there's certainly room for local production. That was the aim of our project. And this is finally also going to happen in, in Colombia and Swaziland in our product project, that it's local manufacturers. So uh, it's not patented in any way, except uh, if you use the Schuylkill technology. But the, the, the general principles, they're not patented. They're, they're free of use. So um, so if you have a look at the um, at the technology transfer guide and uh, and come back with some uh, manufacturer names, I'm sure that we can help some way. This is a very good point. And actually, the technology transfer is one of the main uh, aims of the culture innovation hub. So I can, I can envision uh, to continue this collaboration and have the DTI experts yourself on the ground in the Philippines working with the local industry. So uh, uh, the, the, the first part was, this technology is there opportunity to implement field test in Philippines? Would that be of an option? Let's say the, in the next year. Uh, the, the project is is running out, but uh, might be extended further. But we have uh, we have identified some uh, some field testing technologies, uh, so we can we can give some uh, guidance how you can field test them, and uh, which data should be collected. Excellent. Thank you. For that. Please uh, stay with us for after the second presentation. We will we will uh, continue the discussion. Uh, for now, I will ask Devin to please introduce our uh, second presenter. Thank you very much again, Ivan. Yeah, thank you for listening. Uh, yeah, so I would like to uh, take the time now to introduce Mr. Uh, Larry Acera. And uh, Larry, if you are listening, could I please ask you to uh, connect with us now? Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, so we're uh, really excited to have you on, and I'd like to hand over control of the slides to you. So whenever you are ready, uh, you're good to go. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, th thank you, uh, uh, Devin and, and, and John, uh, if you can hear me still. Uh, also, thank you to the Cold Chain Innovation Hub for uh, inviting us to speak today. Um, in overview, we will be talking about the, the use of our solar microgrid power system as part of the farm to market uh, food cold chain. And more particularly, we'll be talking about the clean food cold storage hub at the New Clark City. So we, we started the, this project in, actually in, in consultation with the Department of Agriculture because they were interested uh, whether or not uh, our solar utility scale could provide power to cold storage as uh, either backup or, or full storage. Um, we looked at some of the parameters and said, well, let's put a team together. So uh, in the next slide's an introduction, uh, here's who, who we are and who the stakeholders are for this new Safe Food for All, which is the Department uh, of Agriculture initiative. Uh, and on our part, we're providing a new cold chain agri agribusiness model. Uh, Sunray Power is a Philippine renewable energy development company. Uh, it, it's the sponsor for the uh, food cold chain hub that we're proposing uh, in the new Clark City. And it's in collaboration with the Department of Energy uh, and the Department of Agriculture. Uh, but more important, our partners in this are the developers overall of the new Clark City, administrative and of uh, a non-government or a government agency called BCDA, uh, Basis Conversion Development Authority. They have the oversight of New Clark City, which is in the Tarlac province, not to be confused with the Clark that's over in the Pampanga side. So the Safe Food for All initiative uh, is really part of a Department of Agriculture's plant, plant, plant. And so we have a site that's identified that, that we can uh, propose this food cold chain hub uh, utilizing our microgrid through our company and technology called Solarize. Uh, and it specializes in the uh, use of solar plus batteries, PV plus batteries. Uh, and we've looked at it in the uh, uh, technical park called the Ecolux Technical Park, uh, which would house a, a pilot project that we're proposing. Uh, so th those are the stakeholders. We put the team together and said, well, what would be the objectives of this whole project? Since we're the developers of the whole technical park, but our core business is really um, really a utility scale solar power plant. We don't make solar panels, we don't sell solar panels, uh, we don't do residential. We build power plants, utility scale, megawatts, size, 
and what we do for in our business, Sunray, is to sell power. So combined with this, the objectives that were given to us, uh, if we wanted to participate, uh, is to promote a sustainable agriculture value chain. And that would include promoting private sector investment. That's we're a private sector. Um, the obje objective of the DA, Department of Agriculture, was to enhance food security and safety, to minimize food waste and, and food losses. And they wanted to, receive, wanted to revive the whole domestic food market. Food that is grown here in the Philippines, in this case, northern Philippines, and brought into the uh, uh, urban area. And we're located between uh, where the farms are up north and the urban area called NCR, or uh, Metro Manila. But more important, we were asked if we could, as an objective, could we bridge the gap between the producers, the farmers, and the consumers? So with that objective, we were then asked, can we also initiate modern agribusiness technologies into this model. And we were asked, could we develop energy efficient food storage hubs? Could we incorporate clean and green technologies? Could we reduce greenhouse gas emissions emissions, and, uh, of course, reduce the carbon footprint? Uh, can we find industries and technology that use low emission and uh, technology and uh, machinery and, and that use natural uh, refrigerants? And then because of the pandemic and the, and the COVID crisis, we were asked, could we upgrade either existing or build new ones is what we're doing, cold chain facilities uh, that can meet the new biosafety COVID-free health standards that are being developed. So we said, okay, in order to do this, let's look at this food chain. Uh, here's the farm to market food chain. Where do we fit in, okay? There's the farm over on the left side. That's the farmer. We talked about the... Uh, the, the, the harvest, pre-harvest, we heard about the pre-cooling and some other seminars and, of course, bulk storage, going into a um, either a warehouse, if not a warehouse distributed on the chain here, uh, straight to the truckers or distributors and then straight to uh, Manila in this case. Uh, our proposal is that we, in that food chain on the right side there, the diagram, we, uh, we actually uh, develop a food cold chain storage hub, a regional hub, where you can bring all the foods in at the regional hub uh, in the New Clark City, uh, which is only two hours away from the uh, uh, main uh, Metro Manila. Um, and then we started dealing with these uh, uh, post-harvest uh, issues, which we'll cover in, in, in the next slides, because it was a learning experience for us too, because we're not in the refrigeration business, we're not in the cold storage business, we're not in the farming business. We're developing uh, a, a very large scale power plant uh, to provide power in a, in a green industrial estate and a new city. So let's look at uh, the location. Uh, we're located in the Clark Green City, or used to be Clark Green City, now New Clark City, which already has a national government uh, administrative center. It's a place where the SEA Games were held. Uh, we're only, uh, what, five kilometers from the new international airport, the Clark International Airport, which is completed. Uh, and, and we're really on the way between uh, Baguio, Bangat, northern Luzon, where the food pathway comes to Manila, and we were ideal location uh, to make a, a, a large-scale hub. And everybody looked at it. We started assessing where we're at in terms of our overall plan, and we said, well, you know, our main business is to, to build a big uh, power plant. This is, a, by the way, that uh, was mentioned earlier by Devin. We're, we have the license to build a 100-megawatt solar power plant. That's utility scale, and we would provide electricity into the grid for the whole new Clark City. You know, with the new Clark City, we, we're talking uh, uh, 1.8 million people coming in, in into there and the new development of a metropolis. Uh, we're talking 800,000 workers. And of course, this is the new smart, green, clean, resilient city that everybody's been talking about, of which the SEA Games were held uh, last November. Um, this new Clark City is in a Clark special economic zone. And because we're in a special economic zone, not only do we have uh, economic incentives, um, we, we also have incentives to uh, streamline. Uh, we've been working with uh, anti-red tape people to say, how can you streamline permits? Because we don't actually get permits from the city or the province. We do it under the special economic zone. So it's streamlined and we can move fast. Okay? Uh, there's an Ecolux Techno Park designated there in the master plan, and that's where we would locate in what's called the Agra Industrial Complex, uh, this new 
uh, proposed food cold chain hub. And, and of course, originally we were just looking at, well, we'll just sell you power from the power plant, the 100 megawatt power plant, which by the way, happens to be next door, okay? I think the next slide, um, there, oh, oh, this slide shows <laughs> what's there now. <clears throat> Over the last two years, uh, this center has been built, the National Government Administrative Center, which the country now wants to move everything there because it's resilient. There's, uh, we don't have to worry about the floods. We don't have to worry about the earthquakes. Um, and then there's athletic stadium there and an aquatic center. But more important for us and for this discussion, there's a, a huge innovation and industrial corridor. Now, in that innovation industrial corridor, that's where we come in. Uh, we were uh, basically awarded a contract uh, through BCDA and 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 in working with the Department of Energy, we were able to establish this uh, Ecolux Techno Park. In this park, you can see the big, big area. That's 100 hectares. That's the uh, solar farm central power station for the whole new city. We are the green developers of the whole new city. Uh, in this uh, master plan here, there's 50 hectares set aside for science and technology. Uh, there's another uh, 38 hectares for a clean tech, clean tech innovation hub. In other words, all of the neighboring industries here uh, are, are going to not only use our green energy, but we're attracting green tech uh, manufacturers, R&D, science and technology. Uh, we have preliminary uh, uh, proposals from uh, battery manufacturers, solar panels, uh, wind, and LED lights. Um, and then, of course, we have the residential and housing that's related to the employment here. And that'll be a, a solar village too. For future, we have a sustainability institute designated there. The sustainability institute is a, an academic forum where we'll be inviting speakers from all over the world for forums such as this, these international forums that share the knowledge uh, so that we can transfer new technologies. Uh, we're bringing a lot of new technology into this park, including our batteries, which come uh, from outside the Philippines, our high-tech uh, batteries. Uh, we, we have. Uh, an arrangement with Tesla to, to bring in some uh, high-tech lithium uh, and derivatives of lithium-ion batteries. This section here in the lower right is where we've identified as a biotech or agritech industrial complex. We're proposing to put a pilot project there so that we can test all the parameters for actually developing uh, and putting up and, and attracting, hopefully, uh, an operator and user that would want to be green and meet the criteria uh, that we're looking for in our Ecolux Techno Park. Uh, in order to do this, we did a, a case study because we wanted to gather the facts. Uh, you know, what did this involve? This whole uh, cold storage warehouse uh, and, and particularly the, the food cycle. So uh, we gathered information over on the left. You see this chart, there's an energy profile. We got an energy use profile and found out that 54% uh, of electrical needs are for re refrigeration. You know, another 19% is for electric defrost. And then you got office and lighting for another 10%. But it's that refrigeration that's a major part of the electrical use for a typical storage facility. And then we said, let's gather some data in the arena we're in. We're in the energy business. We said, well, what is the power that's coming in to the new Clark City and that would feed into a cold storage hub or, or several warehouses? And, and uh, you know, from the Department of Energy, it's, it's known that here in the Philippines, not only we have high rates, we, we uh, rely on coal-fired uh, fossil fuel power plants as a major source. Uh, that is the major source in the Clark Green City. It comes from Sual, it's a coal-fired plant. Um, we looked at the, really, the high cost of energy. There, here in the Philippines, we're, we're talking uh, maybe 10 or 12 pesos, which is like 20 cents uh, per kilowatt hour. Very, very high cost. And then we looked at um, a metric called the uh, SEC. That's the specific energy uh, consumption. And, and that's a figure we use because it basically quantified the amount of energy per cubic meter uh, per year, which is uh, a metric I think that, that the cold storage, energy, uh, cold storage um, industry uses. So that's around five uh, kilowatt hours per cubic meter uh, per year. We gathered all this information and said, okay, what do we going to do with this? So over the right side, we did this <laughs> matrix we call the uh, uh, by the numbers. Okay, so here's some numbers that we've picked up from uh, the studies done by the uh, mainly, I think, uh, CCI uh, 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 hub, uh, the cold uh, chain innovation hub, provided all of this information. We pulled it out. But what's 30 percent 
uh, this is actually from the Department of Agriculture. There, thirty percent of certain food waste, uh, or, or the food cycle, or go to waste. You know, they're lost, they're wasted, and or no refrigeration. Okay, what's the seventy-three percent? We were told that that's the, the large portion of the operating, the OPEX of, of a refrigeration uh, uh, unit, uh, goes towards providing <laughs> electricity or paying for electricity. Uh, what's the ninety-one? Ninety-one is the number of cold storage facilities just in the Manila area. And, and that's the market we're looking at because we're right into northern Luzon, we're right into the, what's called NCR, uh, the National Capital Region. I think there's like 12 or 15 million people there. Um, what's a 98%, 95%, I guess it is. The, uh, we were told that 95% of the cold storage units today in operation, I guess of the 91, or there's actually 233 units around the uh, uh, Philippines, we're told. But 90% use, say, uh, uh, some kind of ammonia refrigerant. So uh, we wanted to find out exactly what kind of uh, market there was for that or, or what the units would use if they were going to locate in our park. 98%, uh, that's an interesting figure. From uh, the business side, uh, that's a, a, a market trend that's kind of interesting because the facilities we're talking about are 98% of capacity or filled. So there's going to be, and there's a huge demand. And, the last by the numbers is 10 percent. I mean, that's a number uh, I think we got out of your previous uh, presentation. I think the, the, the coal, coal Chain Association, Philippines, said that, that this industry, the growth in this industry, uh, is projected to be 10 percent a year for the next five years. So given by the numbers, given the energy profile, given the energy data that I just showed, we said, what can we put together? So we said, well, before we put a project together and, and either invite a cold storage uh, uh, enterprise to come in, we need to know, and they need to know what our sustainability criteria is. And so this is our mandate as a company, no matter what, okay? If we're gonna build a clean cold storage warehouse, as we show in this diagram, we've gotta have clean power, has to be clean facility, they have to use clean refrigeration, uh, and has to be in a clean zone in terms of location. So our clean coal storage warehouse, if it's going to come here, on the clean power, that's our core business. The clean power is no fossil fuel, 100% renewable energy, uh, zero greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we also want to make sure the economics works. And we've done this enough to know that we can deliver, unlike three or four years ago, we can deliver power generated by solar, whether the microgrid or the big utility scale, lower price than, uh, than the retail uh, price that's paid to the utility. Uh, in Clark Green City, in our project, we're located on the site. We have no transmission costs. We have no distribution costs. Uh, the cost of solar has gone down like, hey, 70% in the last three years, and the cost of batteries have gone down. And in terms of the clean facility, uh, there's a lot of uh, standards being developed now beyond environmental standards for LEED, L-E-E-D. Uh, there, there's a lot of standards being put together to make clean facilities clean in terms of COVID free. So we're looking at those and all the energy efficiency standards to combine it into one whole clean cold storage warehouse, which will be our pilot project. Okay, so let's look at our pilot project. We obviously would use our, our, our technology, solarized microgrid power system. Uh, in this slide, you'll see we have these battery storage units or like 40 foot containers uh, each one has batteries in them, and then we charge the batteries through the solar. Um, the, the warehouse can have solar on the roof, but that's not enough to really run the warehouse. Maybe that's good for offsetting it. Uh, we want to run the 100% warehouse by renewable energy uh, using a combination in the, in the third picture there of uh, high-tech batteries and, and the, the, the most efficient, uh, reliable solar panels. So what are we looking at in the pilot project? On the map I showed you in our biotech or ag tech zoning, we we're going to set aside five hectares. Uh, those five hectares, maybe a couple of hectares are for the uh, microgrid power system, and the, and the other three hectares can be uh, uh, a warehouse, a clean warehouse with all the standards we talked about. Uh, and we're thinking maybe five or a thousand or 10,000 square meters of, of warehouse. We, we don't know. This is in the, in the design stage. And we're thinking we could put all this together uh, in the next four to six months, maybe second quarter, uh, 2021, uh, having this unique solarized microgrid power system for the, uh, for the warehouse. 
So this is just for, for the more technical people or those on the utility side. Uh, the bottom line is there's a warehouse on the right. There's going to be a meter. They tie in the meter. And what goes on the other side of the meter is in this diagram. But they basically get a utility bit. We'll sign up our purchase agreement with the cold storage uh, locator, and they'll have a guaranteed rate. Uh, none of these demand charges, capacity charges, uh, uh, charge here for distribution, charge here for um, transmission, because our microgrid will be on site. It'll be dedicated specifically for that cold storage warehouse. We'll have uh, solar panels called solar PV. That's our power generation. We'll have our batteries with inverters. Uh, the batteries will be on the site. Um, we'll have all the control system, the hybrid control system from DC to AC. We'll have a mass control system. Uh, we'll have switch gear, our own step up, step down transformers. But more important is the power station up in the right corner. So that power station is our own little utility substation. And we will sell power directly to your meter or to the meter of the end user. That's the system uh, from a utility point of view, business point of view, technical point of view. It's all into this, this one diagram. And we plan to do that as part of our pilot project uh, in the next four to six months. So in the end, what do we want? Okay, <clears throat> In the end, we're proposing this new cold chain agribusiness model. And there's, there's four areas that we're going to cover when this, when this new uh, food cold chain storage facility comes in. We're, we're, number one, we're looking at an integrated pack house, clean cold storage hub, natural refrigeration systems, green electric power source, modern sorting and processing uh, equipment and center. Um, we'll have, we'll comply with biosafety health building standards. Uh, we've been asked, can it be COVID free, sanitation infrastructure that's gonna be not only COVID free, but clean. Um, clean air filtration. Uh, we're gonna make sure that those systems that come in, uh, the HVAC and all of the exchange of air is clean and, and of course, the sub-zero temperature controls that was talked about earlier. Uh, three, the energy efficient systems. That, the facility has to be energy efficient before we even bring in solar. So we, we really require that, there, that they meet the lead green building code, uh, that, that there's either zero to low carbon emissions, and, and most of all, the new energy efficient standards that DOE has put out. So that building is energy efficient. It would require less energy. Um, and then finally, the renewable energy factor, okay? We're in that business. Our solarized microgrid power system uh, can provide clean, reliable, uninterruptible power, and we think we can uh, provide uh, power at a, at a pretty good discount rate compared to buying it off the utility. Uh, under the new standards with the uh, DOE now, with the uh, green energy option and the renewable energy certificates, uh, people have a choice now under the RCOA, the Retail Competition and Open Access Rules, uh, users and users have a choice now to buy uh, from uh, green technologies. And there are many incentives to do that. So that's our project that we want to put together, our pilot project. So I guess I can wrap this up with really quotes from uh, other people that are looking at what we're doing and, and uh, how we're doing it. This is from uh, Secretary William Dark. The agribusiness sector must build more coal storage facilities. He continues and says, this will maintain the freshness of farm products, reduce post-harvest losses, and improve the Filipino farmer's income. That is what's motivating us to do this. And finally, um, there's a new ambassador for food security. His name is James Reed. He represents the uh, younger generation, the millennials. He's uh, in the Philippines here. He's a famous singer and actor. Um, he's the, uh, the new ambassador for food security. Uh, and he says, now is the time to develop new green and clean food storage facilities for a more sustainable agricultural future for our generation and generations to come. So with that, I'll close my remarks and we'll open up for questions on our Safe Food for All, which is our new cold chain uh, agribusiness model. So thank you very much. Hey, thank you very much for a fantastic presentation. Uh, the issue I have now is wh which question to start with, because we have a lot of them. 
As far as uh, we are aware, there is not such project around the world. We didn't hear anything about you know similar scale. Uh, this the concept you know, in basically the technology in, in the HVAC industry. Uh, when we talk about CO2 emissions, it's always about direct and indirect emissions. Direct emissions being associated with leakage of refrigerant and indirect with the energy consumption. The concept that we have in basically solving the majority of the problem, the indirect uh, emissions we are offering cleaner and cheaper energy for the cold storage operator. Sounds like a no-brainer. Now, what is the <laughs> what is the line in Q1 next year? And this seems to be very attractive uh, opportunity for the cold storage operators as well as for the refrigeration systems to what is the best way to proceed from here in case of an interest on their side? Uh, if I heard you right, you're asking what's uh, how are we going to do this or what's the best structure to, to move on this? Is that what you're asking? What, what would be the next process for the industry that is interested to work with you? Well, if there's, okay, well, first of all, we're not in the cold storage business. If there are any uh, cold storage uh, uh, enterprises that want to locate their facility given the parameters we just gave please contact us through your uh, uh, your hub here I, that's why I, I thank you very much for this hub because we can use it as a clearinghouse they can contact us we're going to uh, we've pre-designed the, the of course the solarized microgrid we've done some numbers and think that uh, a one or two megawatt uh, we use that uh, a specific energy uh, 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 consumption rate and we've done some other uh, research on facilities in that in that size uh, we think we could have uh, one or two megawatts available uh, in the next two, three months uh, on site and on the same lot, because we control actually 260 hectares, but on that same lot, we would uh, invite uh, potential end users uh, to please contact us and maybe they can move in because we would provide the site and the power. That's what actually our role. So, so that answers your question. We, we're ready to form uh, either a collaboration or some kind of business enterprise to, to look at this. Uh, we have the land, we have the power, the, the solar power. Uh, we just need the expertise uh, on the cold storage uh, facility. We have the uh, highest energy prices in Southeast Asia. What would be the business model looking like in terms of the ROI? Let's say, what, what is the energy price? Is it? Uh, I mean, what's what's the cost? Basically? cheaper of the energy can be accessible for this facility. So, so depending on, again, we're just selling power. Uh, the Depending on the, the actual size of the facility and, and what their energy requirements are, we know that uh, we can provide power uh, 20 to 30 percent cheaper than the retail rate, okay? And we've had uh, clients, these are all uh, business to business. That's the other thing. We're not controlled by the ERC. Uh, we negotiate the power rate directly with the end user. So when they come in, they can negotiate the uh, land lease with us. They can negotiate the uh, power pricing. And so the ROI, if, I mean, if you can, uh, let's say even if you had a 10% discount on the rate, uh, we also have good rates on the land, of course. Uh, but combined together, I, I don't know what the ROI would be on uh, for the uh, enterprise uh, that's going to move in. I know what our ROI is. <laughs> On the solar, I mean, you have to understand on the solar side of the business, because we're in the Clark Economic Zone, we uh, and also because we're renewable energy, we uh, have a seven-year income tax holiday. Uh, we do not pay VAT sales tax on the electricity we sell, uh, and we do not, uh, and we're duty-free. So we're able to discount this electricity uh, to a point that that can attract the enterprise. If the enterprise is coming in, I think we're open for uh, any discussions on how they want to structure that. I think that answered your, your question. Excellent. Final question from my side, and then I would ask uh, also Ivan to join us for the follow-up Q&A. This uh, first pilot project, are you looking at replicating this model elsewhere in Philippines, let's say over the next couple of years? Yes. Uh, we, right now, we're, we're concentrating on the Philippines. <clears throat> Excuse me. Concentrating on the Philippines for now. Uh, but this seems to be the, if this model as a pilot works, uh, we think we can duplicate that in uh, various other locations within the Philippines. Uh, uh, right now, this is our 
the, the area that we want to concentrate on because we've established our um, renewable energy business here, uh, given all those kind of incentives, given the high cost of electricity here in the Philippines, we want to concentrate here in the Philippines first. If you don't get better so, yeah, than there'll be other places, uh, if, especially if you're in an economic zone. If you're in a special economic zone in the Philippines, uh, we, we definitely will look at that. And, and that a lot depends on all the things, uh, the parameters I just showed you, the location, uh, the stakeholders that would be involved in it, because you can't just put uh, uh, a microgrid anywhere. Uh, given all those kind of incentives. Uh, it cannot get much better than having 100% renewable energy powering uh, energy efficient coal storage using natural refrigerants. That's basically the, the, the final game, I would say. With that, thank you, Larry, very much. Please stay uh, with us. And I will ask Devin to uh, moderate our follow-up Q&A. We'll run for about 10, 15 minutes, so we'll go a little bit longer, but I'm sure there's going to be a very interesting discussion. So Devin, up to you. Perfect. Um, Ivan, um, I'd like to ask you a, a question. Um, you know, considering this whole presentation and, and the theme of this, uh, this webinar with, with Larry's presentation and your presentation, your uh, equipment is on the smaller scale, and Larry's uh, presentation was talking about larger scales. And because we're talking about the whole chain and the whole system that has to be working uh, together, interconnected, do you see a potential good fit between the smaller scale equipment that you were talking about with your uh, presentation and the sort of ecosystem with the renewable energy generation of new Clark City. Uh, do you see that working together as a, as a clean cold chain? Uh, I, I would say it has to work together. Otherwise, it, 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 it wouldn't work. So we have to bring the products from the farmers to, uh, to Larry's uh, large scale uh, cold storage hub. But, but in order to do that, you need some uh, collection facilities and maybe you even uh, need to, uh, cooling during transportation. So depending on, um, on the actual situation on the different islands, there can be different solutions, either using uh, mobile uh, systems or you can have small collection centers with uh, just a, a small array of solar collectors or solar photovoltaic panels for, let's say, for milk cooling or for temporary storage until the, the, the transport uh, is going to the larger storage facilities. And, and also the other way to the, yeah, and, and the, to the consumers. So uh, like, like we have seen the, on the pictures from uh, Swaziland, if you have shops in the countryside like that, that have no or, or very uh, unreliable electricity, that could also be uh, a, a way to, uh, let's say, integrate the, the whole chain. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes. And, and I think, um, you know, transport is also a major part uh, that we haven't discussed today, but we, I, th I think will be a, a critical piece of this clean cold chain um, powered by renewable energy that we will need to be talking about in the in the near future. Um, Larry, I have a, another question as well for you. Um, you know, considering some of the smaller scale um, solar equipment that's being used for cold chain, um, and then the larger utility scale uh, equipment that you're uh, working on as well. Um, what, what are some of the challenges that you, you think will be the, the, the main challenges going forward um, with, with this type of uh, technology or with, with your, your development project as well? What, what do you see as the main challenges uh, going forward? I think after we do our pilot project, we'll find out. I think the energy profile <clears throat> uh, needs to be more clearly defined. Uh, as you know, solar is only generated during the day, right? Uh, but the new technologies with batteries can uh, store uh, electricity for the nighttime and, and certainly to offset any peak. So uh, I'd like to, I think one of the challenges is to see really what the energy profile per hour is at 24-7. Uh, what are the peak loads uh, for the cold storage facilities? They, right now, if they hook up to the grid, they, they get a lot of other charges based on peaking, on uh, demand charges, capacity. Uh, we're not going to have any of that. We're just going to have a flat rate um, at the kind of discounts we talked about. Uh, but the challenge really is, is for that facility to really want to uh, rely on our 
want to go green, I guess. Uh, there, right now, there's a tendency, it's, it's uh, more, um, I guess there's more comfort in hooking to the grid, knowing that it, it, it's there. But there, <laughs> if you look at the number of um, uh, brownouts and, and the kind of disruptive service there are in the grid, you'll find out our solar microgrid has designed. And by the way, we're only talking one or two megawatts. Now, that's large, but it's small for us. Our big power plant in the uh, New Clark City is 100 megawatts, OK? Um, a one or mm -hmm. two megawatt, I think, is sizable enough to, to handle a, an initial pilot project. And if that works, we can, uh, I would like to see the hub have several uh, warehouses there, if it works. Uh, the other challenge is that it's not an energy deal. It's what I think Ivan brought up. It's the logistics part. We're not involved in the logistics, okay? And, and whether it's a refrigerated truck or, we, we just have a, an understanding that the Department of Agriculture can arrange with the small farmers to, to bring um, their food products here and we can eliminate the waste. If we can have cold storage uh, to, to help their part. I think that, that, that'll make us happy. So uh, the main challenge is, is, is uh, getting the, the findings from the, this first small project. Uh, logistics. Yeah. Uh, we have a, we would have an issue with having diesel generators, di excuse me, diesel trucks coming into our site <laughs> because they contribute to the greenhouse gas emission. So we would uh, challenge the refrigeration trucking business to, to either go all electric or, or be at least on gas, okay? Uh, but we try yeah. to make the facilities clean as possible. We did not look or talk about logistics and that's maybe something your CCI hub can address in another forum. How do you move this uh, food product within that yeah. food cold chain that I gave you earlier? Thank you, Larry. Uh, I will step right. in. Uh, we have questions from the audience, uh, so I will I will uh, look into some of them. Uh, some of them are technical, so uh, maybe just to just to repeat that Larry is not an expert on refrigeration technologies. Larry is an expert on the providing of the solar power. So we might not be able to uh, answer all the questions. Maybe you can help uh, in some, with some of the technical questions on a larger scale. I will start with uh, a question, and I will also push it to the slides so we can see the question. Energy costs seem critical. If all others are equal, would you say that locating and operating a cold chain storage in your site will be profitable or financially feasible? A question for you. The, the numbers that we looked at in the case study, and now we haven't built the pilot study yet, but we, we know that if power is 70% of the operating cost and we're selling power cheaper than what they're paying, that obviously reduces your operating expenses. Uh, if you put the cold chain storage facility uh, on our site in the new Clark City, you're gonna get the incentives of a special economic zone. Uh, not only streamlined permitting, uh, but the, the we don't have to, uh, go through the, uh, the, the infrastructure is being built now, the new highway going through. I, yeah, I think it would be very profitable and it could be financially feasible. We'd be glad to meet with the actual end user and, and see what his numbers would be if he's buying clean, cheap power from us, locating in an entity, uh, in an area that has accessibility to uh, NLEX, SLEC and the airport. Uh, I, I can't see why it's not gonna be profitable and I think it's financially feasible uh, based upon at least on the energy side from our side. Now from the whole uh, uh, new city, there, there's going to be a, uh, I think I showed you slides of all the, the development that's going on there now in terms of uh, transportation and, and the new metropolis with uh, all the standards you need uh, for resiliency and green. Thank you, Eric. Uh, I'll move on to the next question. Mm -hmm. So now push to the audience. What scale or capacity of cold storage can be supported with solar power? And is it 100% independent or does it be grid backed up? I believe we, we have already addressed this question, but maybe you can just comment again. Is it is it backed by the grid or it's a full independent uh, facility? The, um, we were looking at the capacity of a cold storage pilot project and uh, we set aside the five hectares uh, maybe three hectares for the land when based on square meters because that's how we look at things it's a is it a 5,000 square meter facility is it a uh, 10,000 square meter but we know that there's different other ways of um, of sizing it in terms of uh, cubic meters and, and metric tons so we we looked at 
a small, uh, I don't know, 100,000, 200,000 uh, uh, metric uh, meters. And then we looked at that, we applied the energy uh, uh, consumption number that was there, and it looked like it was uh, that size project and, and our, or even our 10,000 square meter, that's the footprint, uh, would require uh, two and a half million kilowatt hours. Okay, So if you're buying that from the grid, you're paying 10 cents and you're buying it from us for seven cents. Okay, so that's, <laughs> there, there's your metrics right there in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of your uh, uh, numbers. Now, grid backup. There's going to be a major grid coming through, okay? And uh, that hasn't come through yet. That's why we're doing the microgrid for now. But we are a major utility grid within our own park. The 100 megawatts is the grid inside of the uh, techno park, okay? We're just dividing up some small microgrids on site for that specific uh, project. And, yes, it would be independent power from that, okay? Thank you. And it depends on what you want to buy. I will I'll have a two technical questions. I will combine it into one. And I would perhaps ask Ivan if you if you like to comment on it, uh, unless uh, unless I can also comment later. One question is about the choice of using electric defrost for the for the facility that Larry has uh, shown in his slides. And linked to that is uh, is there consideration of using thermal storage for the facility? Ivan, uh, would you would you comment on the of this technology storage facility by Larry? Uh, yeah, let, let, me, let me try. Uh, regarding the, the defrost, uh, actually in the SDD technology, the defrost is just by passive means because uh, it simply stops in the night time. So you will automatically have defrost in the night time. Uh, so you, but if you have an um, if you have a battery driven storage, it's, it's different. And uh, I, I'm not sure what is the best choice there, but, uh, but defrost can be a, a huge factor, of course, in, in energy consumption. Um, rega regarding um, thermal storage, our impression is that it's far cheaper to, to store energy as thermal energy instead of storing in batteries. Because a, a thermal storage um, does not have a, a limited lifetime like a battery has, and uh, it, it it keeps the full capacity over its lifetime. So uh, so I would go for a, at least a combined battery and and thermal storage system if I would go to, if I was going to upscale this technology. Thank you very much, Ivan. We can see that there is an opportunity for collaboration between uh, DTI and Sunray Power. Uh, I would like to add to that, basically, the, the concept of the cold storage facility is not finalized. This is an opportunity for the industry to get involved, for the manufacturers, for the consultants, the end user, to really find what will be the optimal uh, facility looking like. So I think that this is basically the starting point, and the experts uh, from the refrigeration industry, uh, this is the time for you to get involved and, and help basically refine this facility to be the most energy optimized uh, from all possible angles. So uh, I believe this is, this is the starting point. David, uh, do you have uh, other questions for our, our speakers, please? No, I mean, um, I think maybe we could just have some, some final thoughts. I mean, that's, that's something we wanted to uh, just make sure and emphasize is that this is really just the starting point of this discussion and, you know, how we can really uh, use what's available today in terms of what's been developed uh, over a long period of time using renewable energy and cooling on a small scale and what projects are ongoing today that are really forward looking in terms of developing utility scale uh, solar projects. Um, maybe I could just ask uh, both of you, Larry and, and Yvonne, sir, for some uh, some final comments. Um, starting with Larry, Larry, um, could you, do, do you really, um, I mean, have a, what is your uh, main motivation for, for working on, on this project? Because it's such an interesting and new project. Um, what, what really motivates you to, to really push this, this project forward? And, and maybe uh, Yvonne afterwards. Besides the fact that our profession uh, is actually energy and uh, environmental technology. And as we are committed towards uh, a greener path, uh, you know, on a global basis, we decided we need to be practical and say, can you 
convert this into commercial application to meet the needs of reducing carbon footprint. People say that, but how do you do it? Well, we believe this example of a food cold chain that's powered by a solar microgrid meets that need. Locating in New Clark City gives us the incentive because it has all the technical, economic, and environmental incentives um, to put this pilot project and, and make it economic sense. So there is, I think, one of the questions asked the ROI. The ROI is pretty good on the solar. I can tell you that right now. Uh, can we combine it with the uh, cold storage industry and make it uh, an ROI acceptable for all the stakeholders? Uh, and that's what we, we were asked to do. Can you bridge the gap between the uh, farmer and the consumer? And I think this is one of the type of project that, that can do that and meet our, our, our sustainability uh, goals. Okay. And uh, and my motivation. Awesome. And is, uh, Yvonne with uh, with solar. Yeah. yeah. Um, my main motivation is that uh, we we have a lot of requests during the times uh, where we have been running a solar generation project. We have a lot of lot of requests from outside of end users that would like to use this uh, technology. And uh, they, are, they were all asking for how can we get a bigger capacity? How can we get a cheaper system? How can we get a more reliable system? So step by step, we have been working to improve the, the STD technology and, and we will be happy to expand it further and and not at least to um, to upscale it so we can uh, use it broadly in the, in the food sector. I think that will have a, a huge impact in all parts of the world where we don't have reliable electricity grids. And even if we install it and, and the grid will come later, it's not a waste of money because the PV panels can easily be connected to the micro grids or the macro grids in the future. So it's not a waste of, of money to, to invest in these systems. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Yvonne. And, uh, yeah, you know, I, I know we're running a bit over time, but um... Jan, uh, I'd like to um, thank you both uh, for, for attending today and everybody who, who attended this webinar. Um, Jan, if uh, you want to have any last words. Thank you, Devin. Uh, uh, this is both of these perspectives, I believe, have a huge potential on the ground. Uh, we hope to be continuing working with you both uh, and also meet on the ground in the Philippines and uh, looking into implementing technologies on the ground in 2021 and beyond because the potential is there. The need is uh, is real as well. Uh, and I really believe this is the exciting concept to follow. So we look forward to leveraging the cold chain innovation hub towards making these uh, projects successful and then also help replicate them, not only in Philippines, but beyond. So thank you very much to both our, our speakers today. And we look forward to continuing this discussion. Uh, we can, of course, also uh, organize a continuation of the solar cooling uh, webinar uh, in the uh, future. So looking forward to the updates from both sides, working with you on on uh, pilots that will be taking place in Philippines. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. We will uh, we say thank you again to uh, our presenters, as well as to our delegates who join us today. We have went some 25 minutes over the time, but that's an issue. And we have received questions. So we can follow up on the concept. Uh, we will also be sharing the recording of this webinar with uh, with the whole network of the Coach Innovation Hub uh, by next week. And we look forward to continuing uh, this uh, series of live event dedicated to being, uh, the latest uh, ideas and concepts in the uh, food coaching uh, industry and beyond. So thank you very much uh, and have all have all great day. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Bye.